Thanks. Welcome, everyone. I'm glad to see everyone's face today. Um, so my name is Michelle Tobias, and um, I'm going to be talking today about American viticultural areas and um, a project that um, I undertook to sort of understand how they relate to environmental data. There we go. So I'm going to follow just the standard academic sections that you're used to just to keep me on track. Um, so introduction to this. What is an AVA? So AVA stands for American Viticultural Area. Understandably, I'm going to shorten that to AVA. Um, these are wine growing regions in the United States, and they are supposed to produce a unique quality of wine due to the unique growing conditions in these areas. And uh, the interesting thing is that these designations are used purely for marketing, and um, they are administered by uh, an actual federal government entity uh, that's called the U.S. Alcohol and Tobacco Tax and Trade Bureau. So we shorten that to TTB because that's a mouthful, um, and they're stored as narrative text. So that's kind of an interesting way to store spatial data. But so I'm, I'm interested in looking at these, these regions, these polygons, and finding out a little bit more about them. Uh, the process to make an AVA in the US, if you're curious, is it starts with a petition. So somebody writes an application uh, and submits it to the federal government. And there's a public comment period after that submission happens. And then the government reviews it. They make a decision. And if they decide that they like this boundary, then they produce what's called a final rule. Uh, and this creates a publication that goes into um, our list of laws. So I mentioned that these uh, boundaries are used for marketing. So if you have a bottle of wine from the US, you may see a designation on there. Um, a really, you know, it's really common to see these kinds of things on your wine labels. So things like Napa Valley, Santa Maria Valley, Mount Veter, these are all actual AVA boundaries. And um, I just put this slide together so you can see that these labels relate to an actual geographic area. And uh, these are not to scale. <laughs> so just FYI, we'd have to put them on the map to know which one's bigger and where they all are. But um, these labels are actually related to, um, are, the words on the labels are related to an actual geographic area. So the question that I had in my head <clears throat> that I'd like to answer is, if the AVA boundaries are based on environmental conditions, which is part of the way that they're structured, is when you submit the petition, it needs to relate to this unique, envir <clears throat> unique environmental characteristic. Um, so if that's the case, are some of these AVAs similar to each other? You might expect, for example, if, um, oh, thank you. You might expect that if some of the AVAs are near each other, they might have similar environmental conditions. And then they might, if we do a, a cluster analysis, they might group together. Um, and if that's the case, um, are there, if there are similar AVAs, how are they distributed? Are they actually geographically clustered or not? So that's the question that I undertook with this project. Um, so next I'm going to talk a little bit about the methods that I used, starting with the input data. So, to get these boundaries, I mentioned that they're narratives in text form in the federal government uh, documents. And fortunately, over the last five and a half years at UC Davis, we've been able to spend time digitizing these and making actual polygons that you can use in a GIS and do analysis with. So I used our data from that project. You can find that online pretty easily. Um, and these are polygons, again, of the official TTB boundary definitions. So those went into this process. For the environmental data and for the elevation data, I used data from uh, Oregon State University's PRISM data set. It's an open data set for climate uh, for the contiguous United States. So um, unfortunately, because the data is only available for the contiguous United States, I had to eliminate the one ABA boundary that is in Hawaii that got made in the last couple of years. So that, that one's not a part of this analysis, but the rest of the AVAs are. So again, we've got uh, precipitation, we've got temperature and elevation data going into this analysis. And then also because soil data is something else that's really important when you're defining an AVA according to the rules, 
Um, I have soil data from the Polaris data set. That's another open data set for soils. Um, and I have data at three different depths. I decided to just do the top part of the soil column because that's where the majority of the roots are for the wine grapes. Um, and then also uh, for each of those three depths, I have three different soil components, sand, silt, and clay. So pretty basic in terms of soil analysis, but um, it's a good start. So what did I do with all this data? Let's talk about the methods. So I used, um, I did the programming for this in R. So R is an open language. Um, it's really nice for uh, academic analysis a lot of times. Uh, for the analysis part of this, I've got my list of packages, um, things that might look familiar, familiar to this group are things like GDAL utils, um, but also some other spatial packages like GeoJSON SF, um, SF package itself, Terra is the new um, raster package, and then XPolaris downloads um, the Polaris data. And then visualization packages, um, these got used to make some of the visualizations that I will show you at the end of this presentation, but um, I also use QGIS to make maps because that's what QGIS is good at. So, so here's a lovely workflow diagram, <laughs> maybe a little bit more complex than we have time to get into today, but um, fortunately there's a paper you can read. So this kind of helps illustrate what all I did with all of the data that we just talked about. So the input data, all of that environmental data plus the AVA boundaries, goes into the R script. And the first thing I did with it was do some data processing, it's kind of standard protocol. So I used uh, the Terra package to extract um, some summary statistics out of the environmental data for each of the AVA boundaries. I got um, things like the mean and the range for each of those data sets. And then I calculated a Z-score. And the Z-score, as you can think of it, if you're unfamiliar with that, you can kind of think of it as like turning everything into a percent. So we are normalizing the data so that everything is on the same general range. Because if you think about temperature data versus percent soil composition versus elevation, you can have very widely different ranges. And if we didn't normalize that data, then something with a very big number might skew the clustering and all of the clustering would be based on something like elevation because of the large numbers. So we calculate z-scores to help, help reduce that um, and make everything a little bit more on equal footing. And then for the analysis, once uh, all that data has been extracted and normalized, it goes into a dissimilarity matrix so we can find out how different are these AVAs from each other in this multidimensional space. Uh, and then from that, we can build a hierarchical cluster analysis um, and come up with these hierarchical clusters. And I'll show you what that looks like in a minute. Um, it's a really nice way to understand sort of the complexity of a data set. And so from there, once we have the clusters made, we have this data set that tells you which of the boundaries goes into which cluster and how they're all hierarchically grouped. Um, from there, I started doing the data visualization to better understand what this analysis actually meant. So those clusters got put into um, a process that cuts them into different groups. I decided in this case that I wanted to look at what this looks like with six groups, but because it's hierarchical clustering, you could break it down further or use different groups if you wanted. Um, and from there, then I started doing the visualization. So you're gonna see a map, dendrogram, and uh, a heat map diagram, but not the kind of heat map we think of with maps. It's a, a different kind of situation, but you'll see that. So in terms of the results, now we get into the pretty graphics. Um, so each, each, of the, um, each of the colors here, I'm gonna be consistent with my colors. So the red group is always the red group in all of the, the images I'm gonna show you. The yellow group is always the yellow group. So um, if you have a question about one of them, we can flip back and forth between slides and, and you can correlate that. So this is the hierarchical, hierarchical clustering dendrogram. And you can see that we have different layers to this um, and uh, the dashed line here, the, the gray dashed line boxes represent the different groups when we cut the dendrogram so we get six different groups. And I've also kind of broken down a couple of them into subgroups because there seem to be some slightly different things going on. But you can see how this is, is hierarchically clustered because you know you can break the groups up into you know two at a time um, and get further and down further down 
uh, the tree and kind of get a better idea of how things are grouped up. And you can see kind of, um, I should also mention that the, the height of the y-axis tells you how different they are. So for example, with that, that green cluster up at the top, there's a, a much bigger bar. So we know that those, that group is very, very much more different than the one next to it, just because it has a much taller bar. So one of my questions was, you know, how, once we make these groups, how are they distributed geographically? Um, is there really a, a regional thing going on or not? Um, and there doesn't really seem to be. I thought for sure, especially like, I thought honestly like Northern California and Southern California were gonna group together because of their climate regimes. I thought they're very similar areas. There's a lot of AVAs, for example, in the, the Napa region, Napa and Sonoma. I thought they'd all go together and they didn't. Um, so that was a big surprise. You can kind of see, we kind of get a sort of a bi-coastal distribution for a lot of these. We get um, California and Oregon tends to be similar to things on the East Coast, which was a big surprise to me because I thought, I thought it's different climates, different weather patterns, um, different topography. We're gonna end up with really regional groups and that just didn't happen with this particular analysis. Um, so I think one of the more interesting groups is group four, which is the orange group. This group is solidly coastal which I guess um, maybe makes sense. So we've got a, a definite Eastern sea coast kind of situation going on, but also the Great Lakes ended up largely in this group too. So this seems to be related probably to elevation, but also particularly a, a maritime like climate because the Great Lakes are so large, they tend to have a climate um, that's a little bit more similar to an ocean coast than you would expect with any other smaller lake. So. So that was an interesting result with this. Um, and then also um, a little bit of this seems to have something to do with size, like group one, the green group. Those are all the really large AVAs. So I think that one really is based on the amount of variation. The bigger the area you have, the bigger the variability you'll have in, in things like temperature and elevation and you know rainfall pattern. So um, that group really seemed to be more of a, a variation situation. Um, I don't know, you can dive into these a little bit more. I have a, a much bigger description in the paper of what I think is going on with, with some of these. And um, if you're curious, you can definitely read that. I think me going through all of it right now is probably not that exciting. But anyway, we can, we can talk more about this. Um, one of the other tools I used to try to understand this particular outcome was this uh, tool that's called a heat map, which you know, at first I was excited, so I was like, ooh, we're gonna make maps, but um, it's a different kind of map, <laughs> more of a conceptual map. Um, what this shows you is kind of the variation between all of, all of the different groups in terms of the uh, input data. So you can see that there's a group there um, for like silt, sand, and clay for the different, um, you know, mean versus range. There's a pre precipitation in the elevation data in there as well. And it's kind of nice because if you, I've drawn lines so you can kind of see the, the different groups on there. Um, you can see how some of them have a really clear pattern going on, like group six seems to have a much higher sand content um, than some of the other groups. And for example, uh, the purple group, group three, tends to have a little bit more mean silt. So you can kind of start picking things out, like how are these clustered, why are they together? Uh, you can understand that a little bit better with this kind of diagram. So. Um, Oh, so for example, like group 2B, temperature seems to be a really big issue with that one. So if we click back, we can kind of see like what's going on with temperature. Oh, we've got California and uh, Texas. So that makes sense. These are higher temperature areas. Um, so between all of these three visualizations, we can kind of get a better idea of what's going on. Why is this data structured the way it is? How did the groups get made? So some conclusions that I've come to for this particular data set and this analysis are that the groups really were not explained very well by geographic region. They didn't group up by region the way I thought they would, and that was pretty surprising. Um, I really, I really thought it was gonna go that way. I thought, oh, this is gonna be a boring analysis, but there's a lot more to this apparently than, um, than I thought. So also elevation seems to play a big role in this. Um, 
uh, especially like the coastal group, uh, those are all really low elevation ones. So, um, which makes sense. Elevation plays into a lot of the, the variables. There's probably some correlation in there as well. Um, and then also, again, proximity to coastline for some of the groups was seemed to be a really important factor in informing these groups. So, um, so yeah, just kind of interesting to, to kind of take into account what the different geography is and where these groups ended up. So what could be next? This is a really kind of first pass at, at this, answering this question. Um, you could spend a lot more time with this and explore this data set a lot more. Um, there's so much that can be done, especially with the AVA boundaries themselves. Um, it's a, a data set that hasn't existed for very long, so I think there's a lot more you could do with this. Um, one of the things that could be interesting would be to add in more environmental data sets. So for example, I mentioned that with the soil data, I'm just using sand, silt, and clay, and just the top part of the soil column. You could certainly get more into that. You could add in um, the Polaris data set has a lot more variables you could work with. So we could add in things like um, soil organic matter that uh, might be interesting. So we might also want to, along with that, um, you might want to look at some of the data sets that maybe are more interesting to grape physiology rather than, um, I kind of stuck with the definitions that the TTB has for AVAs, that they should follow um, important uh, climate and soil uh, information and elevation. But that doesn't really necessarily relate to how the grapes are gonna grow. So you might wanna look at some data sets that are more interesting for particular grape physiology, things like um, looking at like soil, or sorry, uh, solar radiation and, and what angle slope these grapes are growing on and things like that. Um, that might be interesting to put in this and do this analysis more from the grapevine perspective than from the legal definition perspective. Um, Another thing I think would be really interesting would be to assess whether the groups that came out of this analysis actually ended up with wines that have a similar flavor profile. So here we're not assessing, do these grapes taste similar because they have similar environmental characteristics? We're just saying they go in these groups. So it might be interesting to take it a step further and have somebody who's really um, adept at tasting wine and say like, okay, if we get wines from these different groups, are they actually similar? Which is what we would expect with the concept of terroir. Um, so if anyone's interested in doing that, let me know. <laughs> uh, it might be fun for some folks to try that and see if these actually shook out. Or if folks are familiar with wines, I'd be curious to hear if, you know, some of these, uh, if you, you know, your personal experience, some of these wines maybe are similar in Maybe this explains it. I really don't know. But it might be interesting to take a look at that and get a better idea if these, if these kinds of groupings actually make sense, if they are useful in reality, or if they're just you know, data on a page. So that's what I have today. I think we've got plenty of time for questions if there are any. I'm happy to field those. So thanks, everyone, for coming. <laughs>